Well, thank you. Thank you, DB, and thanks to all of you for uh, zooming in uh, today. So, so I'm going to talk about um, the use of multiple breath washout uh, to assess pediatric lung disease. And basically, I'm going to approach, we're going to divide this talk into like three broad areas. The first is sort of the conceptual basis of MBW. The second will be sort of the practical aspects of actually performing it. And then finally, uh, data in pediatric lung diseases. So I don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. So to start with, let's just think about what happens every time we take a breath. Right now, all of you, some, hopefully in the last minute, have taken at least one breath. And, and what happens with that breath? Well, in fact, most of that air spends its time going to places like the trachea and the conducting airways where it actually doesn't involve gas exchange at all. And then finally, as you can see from this uh, figure by Weibel, a, a famous uh, pulmonary anatomist, it, a tiny little bit of that air travels all the way down to our terminal bronchioles and our alveoli where it mixes with that gas and then is exhaled. So ultimately, over time, with each breath, some of this gas that's way out in the periphery is going to get mixed, exchanged, and exhaled. And really, the question is, how, how are we going to, if, if we could actually just look at how long it takes or how difficult it is to get that air in or out, that could give us some idea of, of um, how the airways are functioning. And so this is illustrated here, um, kind of if you just followed a single airway all the way down from the conducting airways um, down to the peripheral airways and finally into the intra airways where, where uh, gas exchange occurs. So to do that, we have to find some way to differentiate the ambient air that we're breathing from the air that's inside our lungs. And that's really the basis of multiple breath washout. So one thing you can do is you could fill the lungs with a gas that typically isn't in ambient air, i.e., oops, I have this, oh, I hate it when I do this. Sorry, I'm gonna have to, this thing got set as a default to um, timing and I don't want that. Okay. So one thing you could do is you could use a tracer gas, right? And, and the two tracer gases that have been used are sulfur, sulfur hexafluoride or SF6 and helium. So for example, in this example here, um, you could have your patient breathe in 4% SF6. Of course, most there's no SF6 out in the air that you're breathing right now. So after a while, your lungs will be filled with 4% SF6, and then you can wash it out with room air and measure that concentration of SF6, right? By the way, this reference, Paul Robinson um, in Respiration, is like a fantastic review article uh, if anybody wants to read more about MBW. So one way is you could do that. The other way is to really just wash out the, the resident gas, right? And that would be to do something like wash out the nitrogen with 100% oxygen. And that's what we call nitrogen breath washout multiple, or, or multiple breath washout. And that's shown in this figure here. So in this case, you don't really have to wash in anything because what we're doing is we're just washing out the nitrogen with 100% oxygen, right? And over here on the right shows what would happen. Of course, right, uh, initially about 80% of, our, our, of the air that's in our lungs is nitrogen. And so with each breath, as you get more and more pure oxygen in, you're gonna wash that out until you get down to 1 40th or two and a half percent of the original concentration. And that's kind of set because that's the lower limit of detection for most nitrogen analyzers. By the way, notice how you actually um, wash out a lot of it in the first few breaths, right? So you spend, the la most, you spend most of your time in these last few breaths washing out that tiny, tiny little bit of air that's still left. The other thing you might notice is that, is that these peaks aren't actually symmetric, right? You notice they kind of have this little slope there. And I'll talk about that in just a moment, but, uh, but just wanted to point that out. Now, the idea that um, MBW could reflect abnorm abnormalities in lung function or airway function is not new. In fact, 
This was described back in 1940 in the Journal of Clinical Investigation before it became the Journal of Mouse Investigation, where investigators compared um, nitrogen emptying in emphysema shown here in this uh, um, line over here on the right versus normal. Now this horizontal axis is in minutes. So as you can see, it took much longer for the patient with emphysema to empty uh, the nitrogen um, in his lungs. And that's because of um, ventilation defects and, and poor gas mixing. So, so that's what, how, how we could um, measure washout. And, and we could use that as a way to kind of assess um, how well the, the lungs are being ventilated. So what do we tend to measure? So by far the, the, the primary measurement in MD, MBW is the lung clearance index or LCI, right? And so once again, if we look here, now in this case, it's actually SF6. So that's why it starts out at 4%, but you can see the pattern looks the same. And so this is the pattern of SF6 and getting all the way down to again, 2.5% uh, or 140 of the original concentration. And as you can see, each time there's a tidal breath. So if you think about then all each of, if you add up all these tidal breaths, that's the cumulative expired volume required to empty the lungs. And LCI is defined as the number of lung turnovers required to clear that gas. Um, so it's that this cumulative expired volume divided by the FRC. So a couple of key things because cumulative expired volume is a volume and FRC is of course a volume. That means LCI is unitless. And in fact, because we're dividing by FRC, it's already normalized for lung size. So in contrast to things like FEV1, you don't really have to use a, a you don't need reference equations and uh, measuring height or sex or anything like that. Although there are differences, especially in infants and, 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 and older persons, but in general, especially especially for the range that we're looking at um, in children, LCI is pretty much um, constant uh, um, across that age range. And so if you think about it, the more breath you have to take, the more your cumulative expired volume, the higher your LCI will be. So, so a higher LCI means there's more ventilation in homogeneity. So in contrast to something like FEV1, a higher LCI is shows more lung disease. And that's illustrated in this figure here. So once again, we have like, say in a normal situation, you've got a couple the sort of that idealized two compartment model of normal um, uh, alveolar spaces. And once again, uh, you can see this, this graph that I showed you before that with each breath, you, you wash out more and more of the nitrogen. Now, if you imagine like having like a, a, a mucus uh, plug here or it's not shown here, but let's say that this alveolar um, unit was somewhat emphysematous and had a, was very high compliance so that it didn't empty well, had a high time constant. This unit is not gonna mix as well. It's gonna take longer to, to, uh, to empty out and exchange all this air. And that's reflected in, in, in the um, nitrogen concentration curve. Whereas you can see, again, just like in that 1940 JCI paper, takes longer to empty all the way down to 1 40th. And, and each breath is, is more expired volume, so it's gonna increase your LCI. And again, even the concept of LCI is not that new. Uh, once again, in the JCI in 1952, Ward Fowler, who uh, developed also the Fowler method, um, was describing um, a, a clearance index um, in patients with emphysema that was abnormal. So really for most of this talk, I'm gonna be talking about LCI, but I do wanna mention a few of the other measurements that um, are, um, also use that you might come across. So one is what people tend to call LCI 5.0, and that's actually the number of lung turnovers required to reach 1 20th of the original concentration. Because there's nothing magic about 2.5. Like I said, it, it really was set because it was the lower limit of detection for, for nitrogen analyzers. Um, so you could just look at how long it takes to um, empty 95% of, of the nitrogen. 
The advantage of LCI 5.0 is that it's faster to measure than LCI 2.5, right? Because you don't have to wash out all the way down to 2.5. And remember again, like you spend a lot of time, you spend a lot more breaths actually having to get from five to 2.5% than you have to have to go from 80 to, to 5%. That means that it's easier for young children to, to perform because they don't have to be breathing in and out um, uh, on, on the device as much. Um, and, and so it has some advantages, but um, LCI 5.0 has been compared to 2.5, and it's probably a little less sensitive at de 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 uh, detecting early uh, disease. The other two measurements, I'm going to go into just a little detail, but not a lot of detail. Again, just so that you're familiar. And, and the, the, fir the first of those is what we call the normalized slope of phase three, um, which can then um, uh, be used to calculate these two measurements, s cond and s asin, which are the convection-dependent inhomogeneity regions and the diffusion-convection interaction-dependent inhomogeneity regions. I know that's a mouthful. That's why I have a a figure that I hope will explain that a bit more clearly, as, and then moment ratio analysis. So let's talk a bit, what is the normalized slope of phase three, um, also abbreviated SN3. So remember I showed you when, I, when we looked at those, M, uh, the, those um, washout curves, the peak on expiration really isn't like a symmetric peak. There's a little slope, right? And in fact, if you just did a single breath washout where you had somebody in, inspire 100% oxygen and ex ex exhale it, this is the, the, the um, pattern you would see, right? Uh, and, and initially when you exhale, you're exhaling tracheal and large airway um, uh, gas, right? And so that's why it very quickly um, uh, rises. And then what phase three is considered is, is basically um, uh, due to alveolar um, emptying. And that's why it, there's actually a, a slope to this because it's sort of gradual. And then finally you hit the closing volume, right? So phase three of this uh, washout curve represents the emptying of alveolar gas. And to calculate the normalized slope of phase three, the, the slope it, for, for every one of those breaths, the phase three slope is actually calculated using linear regression. And then each breath has to be normalized. That's why they call it normalized because, because remember each, each breath has a different gas composition because it's not, it starts out at 80% nitrogen, but then later on it's gonna be like 60% nitrogen and 40% oxygen and so on and so forth, right? And then what you do is you take the average of those and that's what's meant uh, as the normalized slope of phase three or SN3. You can then use that to calculate these two other variables that I just mentioned, s cond and s asin. And they have very long names, but this is conceptually what they reflect, right? So that s cond slope of phase three in the, uh, conducting in the convection dependent areas basically represents the, the, um, the slope in these conducting airways, right? Which actually don't participate in gas exchange and really gas flow through there is essentially convective. Whereas s asin, so you kind of think about it like asiner or alveolar, right? It also takes into account the, the, the diffusion uh, 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 part of, of gas transport. And then, as I mentioned, another um, uh, measurement that's used is the moment ratio, right? And so moment ratios, um, basically, so if, if you were, as this figure shows, if, if you were to actually just look at each breath, so on now on the, on the um, horizontal axis is actually breath, and then um, on the vertical axis is nitrogen concentration, you could actually get the total area under the washout curve. And that's what's called M0. You can then actually set different cut points for different dilution numbers, which then can be termed M1, M2, et cetera. And basically the ratio, that's why they call it a moment ratio of say M1 to M0 then is a value that you can look at that will also be increased with ventilation inhomogeneity. So this is a this is a test that again not you can't routinely calculate it. Um, so it's usually it's it's most definitely been used in research. Um, 
it, it, there, there have been some studies, in particular a recent study out of the Toronto group, um, that suggested that it can be more sensitive at detecting early ventilation defects than the LCI. Um, but right now, it's really not something that people use on a regular basis. Just wanted to mention it, so again, in case you come across it or hear about it, you're at least familiar with it. So that's some of the conceptual basis of of MBW and calculation of the lung clearance index. So what are some practical considerations? Well, one thing is what tracer gas to select, right? And, and in general, there's about, as I mentioned, these three uh, choices, SF6, helium, and nitrogen. And each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. SF6 was widely used, especially early on, like in the early 2000s, when, when MBW was kind of resurrected to calculate the lung clearance index. And really, um, traditionally, um, this really required a mass spectrometer, which is again, not something that's practical to use uh, um, in, 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 on, on a clinical basis for sure, but even in research labs, because it's really expensive and very finicky. Um, there are other ways, you can do it now through infrared and other things, so, so that's not really um, kind of a drawback anymore. Part of the thing is though also SF6 is a greenhouse gas, so in certain situations you might need to reconfigure the ventilation in your PFT lab so that it gets recaptured and things like that. So um, in general, especially in the United States, there's not a lot of people using SF6. Helium. Helium, again, a very traditional choice. Um, one, one thing about helium is it's actually very expensive. And it turns out the reason helium is very expensive is twofold. Number one, you actually need to use helium in all those like um, um, explosive detectors. So like for, for, for Homeland Security, they're using up a ton of helium. Secondly, Helium is actually really hard to get. Mainly, most helium is actually um, generated or, or, or collected from nuclear weapons decay. Um, and so it's not really an easy thing to get. Uh, and right now, um, helium is, yeah, is very expensive. Um, also, it's difficult to find a helium analyzer that, um, that is precise enough for, for this sort of, of um, uh, sorry, um, application. So in general, people have not been using helium for, for, um, for MBW LCI measurements. Interestingly enough, right, people use helium a lot for like, well, we use it in DLCO to calculate alveolar volume, and we also use it for FRC measurements, but, but it hasn't really been adapted much for, for, for LCI. So then that leaves nitrogen. Of course, as I've mentioned, one of the advantages is nitrogen is twice as fast because you don't need to do a wash-in period. That has great advantages, especially when working with young children. It's obviously, well, nitrogen is in the air, so really all you need is oxygen, which is pretty widely available. There are a couple of things about nitrogen, though, to keep in mind. The first is that in theory, in contrast to something like helium and SF6, nitrogen's not truly inert. Um, it does diffuse across the alveolar uh, uh, capillary membrane. Um, and so there is potential for some degree of error um, um, using uh, nitrogen washout. There's actually, I didn't put it here, but Daniel Weiner has actually uh, published a paper about that. Um, again, whether that's how relevant that is, um, is, is clinically or even from a research standpoint isn't necessarily clear, but it's most definitely a theoretical concern. The other issue with nitrogen is that um, most people, I mean, not, nitrogen analyzers also are a little bit finicky and unreliable, and they're very noisy. Um, so it's kind of like um, frightening to kids. So, so in, it turns out that nobody actually measures nitrogen directly. It's all, all measured indirectly, as I'll uh, show you in a moment. So, um, so those are the three choices. In general, in the United States, States, most people are using nitrogen breath washout for the reasons that I've just gone over. But it's very important to realize that results, whether they're normal reference control data or, or, or study data, 
between these three gases and even and the way they're measured, whether you use mass spec or infrared, are not interchangeable. So, so you've got to make sure that you're comparing data from the exact same system, uh, um, whether it's for your own research or just looking at, at, at research studies. Okay, so that's tracer gas. What about devices? So there's basically three MVW devices available in the US and, and this table summarizes um, the, the sort of the pros and cons of each of them. So the Echomedix Exalizer D um, uses nitrogen washout. Um, it's actually the most widely dev used device in the USA um, and um, it that the, the primary advantage of the Echomedics is that, it, that the, all of the raw data are readily available to use for quality control. It, it's probably the most um, you, uh, um, accessible for, for quality control. Um, and, and it can actually be adapted for SF6. In fact, it originally used SF6, so you could use it for SF6 if you wanted to. The biggest issue with Echomedics, at least on a clinical basis, is it's not FDA approved, so you can't actually bill for, for testing with that. Um, the, another device is the Inacor LCI device. It actually uses SF6, um, and the way, and, and it's, it's actually able to use a very small amount of SF6 because it's a closed circuit device. There's some controversy as to whether or not that um, affects breathing patterns. Um, and there's limited data access for quality control. So you really can't, it's much more of what we kind of call a black box. You know, you kind of breathe in and then you get a number out, but you don't really know how that number was derived and you don't know um, how, how well the test was performed. It's kind of like, if you did a spirometer, spirometry and all it did was give you FVC and FEV1, but you didn't, couldn't see the flow volume loop, but it is FDA approved. The other device, um, uh, which um, again, more popular in Europe, but it's available here in the United States is the NDD uh, Easy One Pro. It is also a nitrogen washout device. It's actually FDA approved, um, but again, um, in its current format, there's limited data uh, access for quality control, although it, they're, they're, they're trying to change that. It also, it has this very loud control valve when you inspire, and again, it can sometimes um, freak kids out. Um, so, uh, so those are the three devices. Again, as I mentioned, most uh, people in the U.S. are using the Echomedics uh, Exalizer D and and remember what I said before, we've got limited, you know, you can't, these devices aren't interchangeable. So, so it, it, it kind of comes into to play. Oh, and the cost is somewhere between 30 and $60,000 for these devices. Okay, so, so what I want to do is because the Echomedics device is um, most commonly used, I, I wanted to, um, I, I, I think it actually is important to look at a few of the details of measurement. I know it seems kind of uh, granular or esoteric, but it's very important if, as well if, to understand how, how we do that or if any of you ever actually need to measure, uh, want to use LCI measurements yourself. So over here on the left, shows sort of the, 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 the circuit for, for the Echomedics. There's, there's this um, uh, block here that this red circle would actually connect to the analyzer itself or the device itself. And then we have um, on the, the, in this blue uh, handle here is the flow sensor. It's not a pneumatac as I'll get to in a moment. And then, then there's a CO2 sensor and you can see this little um, tubing here. It actually sucks a little bit of air or gas. Um, I can't remember. I think every 100 milliseconds, um, but it sucks it and brings it all the way down to the device, which is off screen here, to measure O2. And then, oops, and then finally, of course, you have a filter. So what does that mean? Well, one thing is it means is that flow is measured here, CO2 is measured here, and O2 is measured way off here. So they're measured at different points in the circuit. So um, to, in order to actually make that little graph that I showed you with tidal volume and N2, all those signals have to be synchronized. Um, and that's actually a key thing. Secondly, as I mentioned, you know, like there's no nitrogen analyzer here, right? Nitrogen concentration is derived 
by basically subtracting the CO2 concentration and the O2 concentration, and then a little correction factor for all those other extra gases that are out there in, in, in ambient air, like argon and stuff like that, it's like 3%, right? So, so that's the way this device works. Again, just a word about this flow sensor, right? So if you think about it, we can't use mesh pneumatax, right? Because a pneumatax, the basis of a pneumatax is that you, you're, you're breathing through a fixed resistance. And so if you know that, so if you measure the pressure drop across that fixed resistance, you know the flow um, by, the, the, by the flow resistance equation, right? But remember that that's based on Poiset's law. And Poiset's law has a density uh, um, uh, element in it as well. And so the thing is that works fine as long as you're breathing in and out the same gas throughout the maneuver. So like with spirometry, people take a deep breath in and they blow out room air, right? But remember that the gas composition is changing with each breath. So therefore you can't use a pneumatac. So all this, the Echometics and actually all these devices basically have to use ultrasonic transducers um, as a way to measure flow. And there's basically one at each end, and, and you basically look at that uh, um, during uh, to measure flow. Okay. okay, so we talked about gas choices, device choices, and talked a little bit about um, uh, the Echometics device in particular because it is the most common one. Um, you, there's one other choice when it comes to children, and that is how you're going to interface the device with the child. Right, because you can basically use a mouthpiece and nose clips, or you can try and use a face mask. And again, like all these choices, they have their pros and cons. Right, um, the with a mouthpiece, um, sometimes kids will chew on it, so that that kind of causes a distraction. With a face mask, there's something to chew on, so you can avoid that. Um, the one thing about um, the face mask is you don't really know what the dead space is. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some pictures about sort of how we try to minimize dead space, whereas of course with a mouthpiece, you know exactly what the dead space volume is. Um, mouthpieces um, require the child to, uh, or patient and, uh, actually, uh, to keep a seal around the mouthpiece. And the mouthpieces, they're very interesting mouthpieces and again, um, they, well, they're, they're interesting mouthpieces. Like if anybody has ever done like scuba diving or snorkeling, you know how you got that piece and then there's a little, there are these little stubs that you kind of bite down on. That's what the mouthpiece looks like. Um, and they do make small ones, um, but, but again, even the small ones can be kind of big for little children. Um, in contrast, as you'll see how we do the face mask, um, the, the leak uh, is, is a little bit more operator controlled. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, with a mouthpiece, you don't have to worry about the upper airway, but obviously with a face mask, you never know how much, you know, they could be breathing through their nose and you can't completely control that. So there's pros and cons to both. Just got to decide uh, one way or another. Okay. And this kind of illustrates uh, sort of uh, the, the two ways. So you can see with a face mask, um, so once again, here's that circuit. So kind of mentioned again that we have the flow sensor here, CO2 sensor here, and then we've got the tubing that pulls off the O2 sampling here. And you can see there's this face mask and this gray stuff here is that therapeutic putty, just like we use for infant PFTs to make a good seal around the face. And you can see that our, our RT is very intently watching and making sure that there's a good seal. And then contrast, mouthpiece is kind of your, your traditional mouthpiece, but you can see it's kind of big and the, the kid's cheeks are puffed out because there's this big flange uh, that, that, that he has his mouth around. And that sometimes they start salivating a lot and they have to stop and then you have to do the test all over again. And so here's just a detail of, of the face mask. As I mentioned, we, you, we put uh, therapeutic putty around the edge of the mask and you usually try to fill the inside to minimize the dead space. But, but uh, th this obviously is not quantitative, so, so you never know exactly what the dead space uh, amount of, of uh, dead space um, uh, is in, in a face mask. All right, so what's, so then, so now we've talked about sort of devices and, 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 the, and, and gas and masks. So once you do all that, how do you know? So just like with spirometry or any PFT, right, quality control is critically important, right? 
Uh, this slide um, summarizes some of the major quality control criteria. And once again, Paul Robinson le has led both the pediatric as well as preschool uh, um, MBW uh, guidelines uh, shown um, in, the, in the references there. So one thing is you have to have fairly steady tidal breathing. I said fairly because it doesn't have to be as good as the pictures I just showed you, but, but, it, it, but it has to be somewhat steady. Mo most importantly, it's got to be even um, because if you keep having varying um, and expiratory levels, it means your FRC is, is varying, which is a problem. Obviously, you can't have a leak. Um, obviously, no, no laughing or coughing. Um, I've already mentioned how it's very important that the flow CO2 and O2 signals are synchronized. And to be sure that you're actually at this 140th, you have to have at least three breaths with a concentration down to this level. And then finally, we, for reproducibility, you really need three reproducible maneuvers with it. And that means the values are within 10% of each other. And just like with spirometry, that, you know, a lot of kids, it takes more than three maneuvers to get the three reproducible ones. So, uh, you know, the key thing is for quality control is training that, you know, careful, rigorous training is really key. Um, for, for cystic fibrosis, um, the uh, um, multiple breath washout center in, in Toronto serves as the uh, CF Therapeutics Development Network core lab for, for multiple breath washout. And um, they will actually certify operators. They don't certify sites, they certify operators um, to be able to do research quality um, MBW, both in pediatric as well as preschool age children. They're two separate certifications, preschool ages three to five years old. And of course, pediatric is six to 18. It's very important to, to maintain ongoing quality control and to use uh, standardized equipment uh, that, I, that I showed you uh, previously. So here's an example of, 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 uh, of acceptable uh, MBW, probably done from, by an adult volunteer because it looks so good, right? So you can see that every breath, very even, stable end expiratory level. So you, so you know you're gonna be at the same FRC um, and both flow and volume are, 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 are fairly stable. And you can see how then nitrogen is shown in the center panel. Again, falls just like I'd shown you before. And you can see how there's many breaths at around 2.5% knowing that you truly have met the, wa uh, the, the end of the washout. So again, this is an example of where, where um, the end expiratory level was very unstable, especially nearing the end. Um, so that really leads to just, uh, it, it, lead, it leads to wide variation in FRC. And remember FRC is in the denominator so it, of LCI. So, so you know, a, a, a small change in FRC can uh, markedly change your LCI. So that's why this is unacceptable. Here's an example of a leak. You can always tell a leak because all of a sudden the, the, the nitrogen level spikes up and it spikes up because ambient air, which is 80% uh, nitrogen, is leaking um, into the circuit, uh, which is, well, depending on where you are, down to 70 or 75% or um, oxygen. And then as I mentioned, this it's the, the the synchronized signals is is a is a is a key problem, right? So here you can see they they really should line up with the green line where where the where the peak of the flow and O2 they all line up. Now the important thing to recognize is that you can resynchronize. You can fix the synchronization if it was off. <coughs> you can do that post test, but that means that you have to inspect the data. And this gets back to what I was saying before about having enough access to the data to be able to actually review synchronization to be sure that it's accurate. And if not, be able to change the synchronization uh, so that, so that the, the, all the signals line up. Because even small uh, errors, again, will, will lead to marked uh, abnormality or marked errors in measurement. So most uh, so far, everything I've shown you really has applied to patients who are cooperative, who could at least put their mouth, uh, uh, mouth around a mouthpiece or breathe through a face mask and, and be able to do that. And, and you know, with, with training and patients, uh, um, 
really 80 percent, uh, 80 to 90 percent of even preschoolers can do acceptable MBW. But what about below that age? So right now, infant MBW is really not widely available and applicable because there's a lot of challenges. So first of all, it's hard to figure out what, what um, tracer gas to use. Um, with SF6, you pretty much need to be using a mass spec to measure it. The problem with using nitrogen washout is that oxygen, 100% oxygen affects breathing patterns. So, so you can't, just use a regular nitrogen washout. Now you can potentially overcome this by pre-breathe, having the infants pre-breathe at 30% FiO2 before starting the washout. Um, but again, that requires having a specialized circuit um, and being able to blend in 30% FiO2 and then start the washout. Definitely a lot of dead space issues because of course you're not going to use, be able to use a mouthpiece um, and so you got to use a really small fitting mask. You just have to put putty in there to try to reduce the dead space. Dead space issues are always a problem with infant uh, physiologic measurements. Um, and of course, you know, this test takes too long to be able to do in, in infants without sedation. So they require some kind of sedation like chloral hydrate. I think most importantly, because infants have such small tidal volumes and low flows, any small errors in the synchronization of the signals or delays in the response time of your CO2 and O2 um, monitors can lead to really large measurement errors. So and really at this time, infant MVW is really a highly technically challenging research technique um, that, that really, um, would require, really requires um, sort of almost a full-time effort um, in developing an infant MBW lab. So very few places are, are actually doing a lot of, of, of infant MBW. Okay, so, so we've talked a bit about the theory of, of MBW and um, the, and, and sort of the practical aspects of MBW. So now let's talk a bit about what M how MBW can be applied to the study of pediatric respiratory disease and, 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 and what's been found so far. And then we'll, I'll, I'll first of all talk about CF because really that's where most of the MBW data have been published. So, so, so really, as I mentioned, by the early 2000s, um, it was clear that, that using um, MBW and measurement of LCI in children with CF identifies disease in, is much more sensitive at identifying disease compared to spirometry. So in this study performed by Per Gustafsson, one of the pioneers of, of LCI measurements, um, he and his colleagues measured LCI and FEV1, or, well really spirometry, in a cohort of of children with cystic fibrosis um, ages 5 to 20. So here, the vertical axis here is um, uh, um, the z-score, regardless of, of what, 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 what test it was. And so, of course, the upper limit of normal is plus 2 and the lower limit of, is minus 2. It just depends on the directionality, right? So the black circles represent the LCI values. And as you can see, really, most of the children, even between 5 to 10 years of age, had abnormal LCIs. Remember, a higher LCI is consistent with more ventilation and homogeneity and more lung disease. In contrast, the white open circles represent FEV1. And as you can see, especially again in, in ages 5 to 10, um, FEV1 was within the normal range. Of course, as kids got older, there were kids that had abnormal FEV1s. But, but uh, in this younger age group, um, FEV1 was normal while LCI was abnormal. And in fact, 65% of children in this study had a normal FEV1, even though their LCI was two standard deviations above the mean or greater. You know, and, and if you think about it, that's just what we know um, in, in, in CF, that spirometry is not a sensitive measure. You know, median FEV1 in six to 12 year olds in, in the United States is 97% predicted, right? Half of all children in the United States with CF have a normal, F, I mean, really normal FEV1, not even like 90% predicted. And, and of course, there've been several other studies uh, around the same time that, that showed this to be the case. More importantly, as shown in this study by Paul Aurora, 
it, preschool LCI tracks with future FEV1. So in this study, what they did is they measured um, LCI then around preschool age, um, three to five years of age, and then they measured um, FEV1 at six to 12 years of age. And um, they, they had a control group shown in the open circles and the black triangles were CF. So what this is basically showing is that, 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 that children with an abnormal um, uh, LCI, which are basically the two right-hand panels, um, were either continued to be abnormal and, 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 and also tracked with kids who subsequently had abnormal uh, FEV1. So, so it's, it, it, it does have physiologic relevance and it does relate to FEV1. So the other things that, that um, LCI has also shown itself to be very useful in evaluation of preschoolers with CF. Um, this was a longitudinal study um, uh, conducted by UNC, um, um, Indiana University here, um, and Toronto, um, where they followed a cohort of uh, preschool aged children with CF and did uh, periodic LCI measurements as well as during times of illness. So the first thing you can see over here on the left, this is LCI um, from three to six years of age. Um, there's a healthy control cohort shown here in the, uh, in the, in the solid line, and as we expected, there was no change in, in, in this uh, line at all. But you can see that over this period of time, um, LCI um, rose significantly um, from a mean of around 8.5 to about 9.7 um, over three years. So uh, it, it, you know, it tracks with, with progression of disease. I think what was very interesting also from this study is that, is that you can use LCI to differentiate between a pulmonary exacerbation and other respiratory symptoms. So um, in, in, in this um, slide, in this figure, it, it shows kind of the distribution of abnormality, ab abnormal LCIs or, or LCI um, in three different situations. Children presenting just with upper airway symptoms, a cough that was deemed not to be pulmonary exacerbation and pulmonary exacerbation. And as you can see, in the pulmonary exacerbation kids, LCI was significantly higher compared to these cases where, where, where there was no pulmonary exacerbation, suggesting that you could use LCI as a way to differentiate um, true lower, tra lower respiratory tract um, worsening of, of disease um, compared to other causes of cough. LCI has also been shown to be sensitive as a sensitive measure um, of treatment response. In a pair of papers performed by um, Reshma Amin when she was in Toronto, well, she's still in Toronto, but, but when she was still doing CF research in Toronto, um, the, their group looked both at the effect of Dornase Alpha, shown here on the left, and hypertonic saline shown here on the right on LCI. And it's not shown in this slide, but it's important. I just want to note that all these patients had mild lung disease by FEV1 criteria. That is, their FEV1 was 90% predicted or greater. So they had essentially, quote, normal FEV1. And as you can see, um, so in the Dornase Alpha study, it was one of these randomized crossover studies. So that's why the, 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 the same group, they got placebo where there's really no difference. And then um, DNA shown here on the right-hand side of the figure. And, and it kind of, the, the way this is graphed, it's like every, every patient, but overall the mean um, uh, uh, LCI dropped by about one unit. And actually, in the hypertonic saline group, uh, the, uh, this was just a, a straight um, RCT. So, um, so this is the hypertonic saline treated group. These are the individual curves, and over here on the right is the um, mean drop. Once again, there was a tr the treatment effect was about one LCI unit, which is kind of turning out to be what most of these treatment effects are. So LCI um, can also be used as a way to measure um, treatment response, especially in children um, with a normal FEV1. So um, I, 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 there's, as I mentioned, there've been a lot of other um, MBW uh, studies in CF. Um, I didn't list all the references here, um, but I, 
LCI um, treatment response has also been looked with Ivacaptor as well as hypertonic saline in infants and preschoolers. And again, in all of those cases, um, there's a significant reduction in LCI with treatment. Um, in addition to correlating with future FEV1, LCI correlates with things like bronchiectasis seen on chest CT um, and um, infection and inflammation, indices of inflammation in children with CF. So again, it is a measure of disease severity. Interestingly enough, if you look at LCI after treatment of pulmonary exacerbation, the, the results are somewhat heterogeneous. Um, the, the mean LCI may, may drop, but, but there's a, a large fraction of patients where the LCI actually goes up. And that, the, the, the interpretation of that is that, is, that when you, is that actually after treatment with pulmonary exacerbation, some units that were completely plugged up and not participating in ventilation are now opened up. And those units, though, are actually not well ventilated. So they actually have the effect of overall increasing LCI. So it's probably actually not that great a test to see whether or not patients are getting better after treatment of a pulmonary exacerbation. The kind of the, uh, the opposite direction might, might, might work. And again, it would, I think it depends on the degree of baseline lung disease. So that is CF. What about other conditions? Well, again, there's actually um, not as much data, but, but the interesting thing is the, 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 the results are probably less dramatic than we see in CF. So in, in this study um, of children with, with um, well-controlled asthma, um, the authors looked at a variety of, of measurements. Um, and, and over here in the center column is the controls and um, over here is, is asthma. And as you can see, there was a sig statistically significantly higher LCI um, in the children with asthma, 6.69 versus 6.24. But, but, you know, that's actually a pretty small difference. And it's not like what you see in CF where lots of kids have LCIs of like 8, 9, 10, or even 14. Um, and, and, and so it's statistically significant, but, but rather minor. But it is also interesting if you look at the pattern of MBW and asthma versus CF, it's slightly different. And, and again, that might give some hints about sort of the differences in underlying pathophysiology. So in this study, uh, again, led by Per Gustafsson, um, they, conduct, they performed LCI in a group of children with asthma and a group of children with CF. So over here on the left-hand side is the LCI results. So once again, you can see that there was a statistically significant um, uh, increase in LCI in the children with asthma, and it actually fell after bronchodilator, uh, shown by the, by the white column. But I just focus on the black uh, uh, bars for right now. But again, you can see it's really not that huge. Um, whereas, again, it was much higher in the patients with CF. But interestingly enough, when they looked, when they kind of compared those two other measurements I talked about, s cond and s asin you saw a distinctly different pattern uh, where s cond right, which reflects kind of ventilation in the conducting airways, um, you saw a, a much higher um, uh, uh, abnormality in, in asthma as well as cystic fibrosis. And, and, and here, the asthma, um, ESCON was actually not that much different than, than in CF. Whereas when you look at s asin, which again is sort of those distal airway um, where diffusion also plays a role, you can see that in fact, this was not statistically significantly different in asthma, whereas it remained abnormal in CF, suggesting that um, CF, uh, the part of the pathophysiology of CF really does involve much more of the distal airways, the very small airways and mucus plugging or, or, or even a partial obstruction by mucus that contributes to impaired diffusion and ventilation. So, um, okay, so then finally, let's look uh, at a couple more conditions. So, um, in PCD, this this um, I, PCD has also been looked at, and as shown in in this study um, from a few years ago from uh, um, thorax. So patterns kind of more like cystic fibrosis, right? The the uh, PCD patients had a LCI of nine point four eight versus seven point one for for the um, 
uh, healthy controls. The Z score was 3.58, so markedly elevated. And similar to CF, uh, a, a, a large fraction of patients with a normal FEV1 had an abnormal LCI. And, and more recently, in a paper that's actually still in press in Annals of ATS, um, the, the investigators compared um, LCI and FEV1 in CF and PCD and showed that really uh, in both cases, um, LCI was abnormal and more, more, more commonly abnormal than FEV1, suggesting that you could use LCI for both these conditions to identify um, impaired lung, uh, lung function. And then finally, what about in preterm children? So again, so the interesting thing is in, 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 in preterm children, it doesn't seem to really be as marked an abnormality in, in, in MBW. Um, in this study, um, they, they studied children six to 16 years of age. Now they didn't, it was like any preterm child, so it was pretty broad range. Um, and as shown here on the left, you can see there's really not a significant difference in LCI. Um, and the, and similarly, actually, S. Asin was 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 uh, um, uh, similar across all three groups. S. Khan was a little bit higher um, in the preterm infants, although again, not markedly. Um, so again, and that's so that suggests again that that that. Um, there might be some um, mild conducting airway abnormalities, at least detected by MBW, um, but but not uh, but it's not marked. Now, in the Epicure study uh, shown here, this was a study of extremely preterm children. The, the gestational age was less than 26 weeks, and these studied children were studied at 11 years of age. So over here on the left is FEV1, and so you can see like FEV1 was was not not only significantly uh, lower uh, compared to healthy controls, but but a lot lower. I mean, for the um, BPD group, it was almost two standard deviations below the mean. LCI again was elevated, um, especially in the BPD kids, but again not by a lot. I, I wrote down here the mean number. So like in BPD it was 7.4 versus 6.5 in the controls. So again, not quite as dramatic as what you see with cystic fibrosis. So kind of summarize, try to summarize that in this kind of simple little table here. Um, so that basically, you know, CF and PCD are conditions where we see markedly uh, increased LCI in children, whereas it's increased, it's, it's, you know, statistically significantly increased in asthma and BPD, but the relative increase is relative, is, 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 is pretty small. So what about um, applying MBW to research and clinical care? So, so based on these data, you know, it's probably most useful for CF and PCD. And the populations you want to focus on are young children with mild disease whose FEV ones are normal. And infant MBW still is a challenge. I think there's definitely some limitations and challenge for, for clinical use. Uh, one thing is time. Um, I mentioned you need to get these three uh, um, uh, studies, uh, reproducible studies, and that can take a while. You know, for us, when we do preschool or young child um, MBW, we, we budget two hours to do the test. So clearly that would be difficult to do in a busy clinic. Uh, the billing issues related to uh, uh, echomedics, and then again, making sure that, the, that you have the technical expertise and are able to maintain it. I think also we, we still have not fully defined what a minimally clinically uh, uh, important difference is, although I think people are coalescing around a, a change of 1.0 LCI units. So in summary, MBW is a sensitive measure of ventilation inhomogeneity and airway disease. LCI is the most common MBW measurements, although there are other measurements. Rigorous training and attention to detail are required for high quality data. And the, the MBW has great potential as a research tool in mild and early CF lung disease. So with that, I'm done with my talk. I think we have just enough time to do a couple of questions and then maybe take, uh, or, yeah, for me to give you guys a couple of questions and then also uh, take some questions. Um, so uh, is it Rebecca, or were, were you gonna put those up? They should be running now. Hmm, oh, there we go, okay. So, so the first question is, 
The reason why the Echomedix XLizer D uses an ultrasonic flow meter is A, flow rates during tidal breathing exceed the flow limits of a mesh pneumatac. B, a mesh pneumatac cannot be used because the gas composition is not constant. Flow rate, C, flow rates vary too quickly. Or D, there is no mesh pneumatac that will fit the mouthpieces used by the Exalizer D. So we'll see, let people vote. So far, we're only at eight out of 50. It's all anonymous, I think, right? Rebecca, I'll let you decide when we should uh, uh, end the poll. I think we can probably go ahead and move on. Yeah. End this one, yeah. Okay, right. So 55% of you answered B, and B is the correct answer, right? Because, because you can't use, use a, a mesh new attack because, because the density of the gas is changing because the gas composition is not constant. Okay, so shall we look at the next question now? Oh, I think that's the same one. In fact, I know it's the same one. Ah, which of the following does not require synchronization? O2 concentration, CO2 concentration, nitrogen concentration, or expiratory flow? All right, it looks like nitrogen concentration is the winner yeah. on this one. And that is correct because that's actually what we're calculating by subtracting CO2 and O2. So it's the other three signals that need to be uh, um, uh, synchronized. Okay, so I guess I only have one minute, but, but, uh, but I could take maybe one or two quick questions if anybody has them. Yeah, I think for questions, um, please type them into the chat uh, function. Thanks, Clement. That was a really thorough discussion of LCI. Um, maybe as people are thinking, one question I have is, uh, you know, in the era of Trikafta, is it, do you think this is going to be, become more useful for us as our FEV1, you know, FEV1 starts to become more normal? Um, uh, yes, I think if anything, um, we're going to need more sensitive measures of, of uh, early and mild lung disease. Um, and whether that's uh, LCI or um, other, you know, imaging measures, you know, part of the challenge for all these things will be time and the, the time it takes to do the test, so at, at least, you know, for, for clinical uh, care. You know, and, and people are actually, there, there are actually ways to do single breath washout. Um, but again, right now that's a, that's a research test.